this morning, we're going to see something very interesting. We're going to see Jesus tell us how not to pray. Jesus is going to tell us what not to do. And seeing as how we're praying to him when we pray to God, we should really take notice when Jesus tells you, oh, by the way, don't do this when you pray. Last week we kicked off prayer, and we saw in the first week that we need to be persistent. We need to be persistent. How persistence pays off in life even with corrupt, evil people. And Jesus draws the contrast, and he says, how much more with a father and a God who loves you? And so we saw the need for us to be persistent. And this week we're going to see from Jesus what not to do when we pray. So join us this morning as we see how not to pray. And we're going to look at a few verses from Matthew 6. You can follow along on your phones or your tablets on the Bible app there. If you don't have the Bible app yet on your phones or your tablets, we'd highly encourage you to download that. But you can follow along on the screens as we start reading this morning in Matthew 6, beginning in verse 5, where we read these words spoken by Jesus. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. So Jesus says, don't be like a hypocrite. Don't be like a hypocrite when you pray. And what's a hypocrite? Somebody who's constantly worried about the outward appearance. Somebody who tries to make sure that their life portrays one thing so that when everybody looks at them, the message that they get is that their life is all put together. And so when people would look at these people, they would think, wow, those are really spiritual people. They have it all together. And yet what we would see time and again through the teachings of Jesus is these people, while the exterior of their lives may proclaim one thing the truth of the story was they were far from God and they didn't understand the heart of God and so here they are and they're all dressed up on the outside they are putting up the appearance it's like when you go for your family photos right you're going and you're out in a field and you're praying for a cloudy day not rain but you just need some some of the clouds and you want the fall foliage in the background and you look at each other lovingly and you force a smile, and mom's yelling at the kids, you will smile when we tell you to smile. And then she's putting up the pictures all over social media and putting them all over the house. Never mind the fact there was three hours of fighting, getting everybody ready. They didn't even want to talk to each other on the drive there. And once you get there, you force the smile. You're freezing. You want to put your coat back on. You just want this process to be over. But at the end of the day, you have a beautiful picture that hangs up. And it portrays something about your family. But oftentimes what it portrays is the direct opposite of the experience to capture capture the photograph. And for hypocrites, that is their spirituality. That your life looks like one thing to the outside, but God sees the inside and he sees the heart. And so Jesus says, don't be like those people. Don't be like the hypocrites who have it all together outwardly. For they love to stand and pray, Jesus continues, in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others for they love to pray to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others they pray but their motives are all wrong they still pray but the motives in doing so they're wrong their prayers their prayers may have even been fine the content of their prayers may have even been fine but the reason that they're praying is so that other people see them Their spirituality is all about what it looks like to somebody else. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. When you pray, don't be like that. Don't be like the hypocrites who love to make a scene of their spirituality, who wear it on their sleeve, wear it for everybody to see. Jesus continues, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. The attention that they get, that's all they get. Jesus says, they have received their reward. Everybody's seen it. They've made, a, they've made a spectacle of it. They've made sure to be noticed. And Jesus says, that's it. That's all they get is they get noticed. And then Jesus starts to draw a contrast. He offers, he offers his followers who are listening and learning about what not to do in prayer. He offers them a contrast. So he says, don't be like the hypocrites who just want to present something, but instead, but when you pray, Jesus says, and here's the contrast. Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. So instead of going out on the street corner 
instead of making it a huge scene, instead of making sure that everybody sees what you're doing and all of their eyes are on you, Jesus says, no, no, no. Instead of that, you go into your room, into your secret space where nobody can see what's going on and you do your business with God there out of the sight of everyone else. That's the contrast that Jesus offers. So what we have to understand is that prayer is an intimate experience. It's private between us and God. Prayer was never designed to be a public spectacle. Now, that doesn't mean that there's never a time for public prayer. Let me be very clear. It doesn't mean that all public prayer is derived from from a desire to be noticed or to be seen. We're not saying that. We're not saying there's never a time to go pray in public. But what we are saying is we have to check our motives. And prayer is designed to be something that's incredibly personal. It's it's designed to be a dialogue between us and our creator. And so it doesn't have to happen in which everybody else sees. It's it's supposed to be something that's that's very, very private to the point. It's between us and, and God. The point Jesus is making is this. Above all else, your motives matter. Above all else, your motives matter. And if your motive is to be seen, if your motive is to be noticed, if your motive is for other people to look at you and to see how spiritual you are, you're wrong. And Jesus says, that's your reward, that people will see you and they'll talk about you and you'll be noticed. But what God offers us in prayer is something so much greater than that. It's something so much bigger. It's something so much more vital and so much more important that we need to make sure that our motives are pure and that our hearts are guided by a deep desire for us to connect with our Creator. And that, at the basis, is what prayer is. And Jesus continues in verse 6, And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So here's the contrast that Jesus offers. Not only do you not go out to the street corners, not only do you not go make this a public spectacle, not only do you not go out and make sure that everyone notices you, you go in your room. That's the first contrast. But then as Jesus continues the contrast, here's what he says. Not only do you not make it this public spectacle, but also when you're in your room and when it's this private conversation with God, understand that while their payoff for those who make it a spectacle is to be noticed, your payoff is that God will bless you. That God will bless you. And so let's make sure that we keep this at the forefront of our minds, that what we aim for is not a public spectacle. What we aim for is that God would intervene in our stories and that God would bless us. And this all goes back to motive. It all goes back to motive. Is what are our motives? What is our reason for doing what we're doing? And when you pray, Jesus continues in verse 7. Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Cut the flattery and talk normally, Jesus is saying. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Cut the flattery and talk normally. I don't know if you've ever been to to a prayer service or a prayer meeting or or something. I, I went to a Christian college, and so I had to go to chapel all the time, and there's a very cynical side of me, and so sometimes I would just, I would just love, I would just love to listen to, to some of the. And again, I don't know anybody's motives, and it was a really immature thing to do. But it was sometimes a game between me and my friends of let's count how many titles somebody can use for God and squeeze them into one prayer. Because I don't know about you, but but sometimes we, if if we're not careful. We completely change our vocabulary when we pray. If I were to approach Brooklyn, my wife, and I were to win up, and I was to go up to her and say, "Great and gorgeous Brooklyn, you to whom bring me great joy, maketh me smile on thou darkest day." Lover of my soul. She would look at me and she would say one of two things. She would say, what did you do? Or wait until the boys are asleep. That's how Brooklyn's going to respond to me, all right? I'm mad at it, but that's what she's going to say to me, all right? 
Because it's not me. It's not me. And I wonder how many of us, because when, when we were real little, we were taught to fold your hands and close your eyes and pray this way, which is great. It's a great starting point. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But at some point, if we never get beyond that, are we trying to fit our prayers into a formula that doesn't fit us? And prayer is something that so many people struggle with because we make it more difficult than it has to be. You don't have to have a certain vocabulary. You don't have to fold your hands. If folding your hands helps you because it makes you comfortable, then by all means, fold your hands. If you want to pray and you want to raise your hands, by all means, raise your hands. If you want to keep your hands down at your sides and in your pockets, you do you. But the point is, prayer does not have to be this complex thing where we change our vocabulary and we change all of our mannerisms. We don't, have to, we don't have to raise our voice a few octaves. We don't have to whisper because one of our favorite pastors that we listen to podcasts of talks in a higher register and whispers. So we don't have to pray, dear Jesus, thank you. just talk. Just talk. We don't have to, vice versa, we don't have to call down the thunder and the fire. of. I was in a prayer meeting one time and a guy prayed for the fire of heaven to come down. And I was like, mm mm. Mm mm. Because when that happens in scripture, it ain't good. Like, I got more life, I still want to live, okay? So, some guys around the table are like, yes, Lord. And I'm like, mm mm. Nope. Let's just hold off. God, yes, we want you to work, but we're good without the fire, all right? Thank you very much. We're good without the fire. I don't want God to flood the world. I don't. I'm good, all right? That happened one time. And, and praise God for Noah, that, that he saved humanity and the animal. But we're good, all right? But there's something where we just throw these spiritual phrases along that, if we're not careful, mean nothing. Just be normal. Just be normal. Just in your voice, in your story, talk about your circumstances. For some people, it helps to pray out loud. Other, people's, other people feel like, I feel really weird if I do that. So don't. Pray in your heart. Don't make it more complex than it has to be. And there is no universal one way that is right for everyone. And so maybe you've been carrying around this idea of this is how I have to pray because that's what you were taught when you were little. And it was great to instill those, those tools in you when you were little to help you calm your mind and to help you focus. But now that you're older, it just feels really foreign, but, but you don't know anything else. And I just want to say, just, just break out of that and just be normal and do what feels right but don't allow any idea that i have to fit my prayers into this type of language or into this type of box to prevent you because it feels abnormal to you it's not what god wants god wants a unique encounter with you with who you are that's what he wants and your prayer is not going to sound like my prayer and that's perfectly okay because you and I are not alike. We're different. We're unique. We're individuals. And so God just here says, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Just be yourself and talk to God. And, and so for some of us, that's going to require a deprogramming of, of what we've built prayer up to be in our minds. And that's okay. He continues, for they think they will be heard for their many words. God isn't impressed with your vocabulary. God isn't impressed with the length of your prayer. He isn't any more likely to answer your prayer if you use a rich vocabulary, if you pray for three hours as opposed to three minutes. It, it, what it matters is, again, the motive. What matters is the motive. Jesus says this, do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need 
before you ask him. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, when God tells us what not to do, we should probably take note. Because it's a pretty big deal. When God says, hey, don't do this, we need to listen to that. We need to make sure that, that that's something that allows that we allow to guide our conduct and our thinking and our, our perspective. And so God says, don't make it a show. And don't make it more complicated than it has to be. So the question that we have to ask this morning is, have we? Have we made prayer a show? Is it a spectacle so that we can be seen by others? Is it a spectacle that we do so that other people look at us and think, oh, that, that somebody's spiritual there? And, and, and again, this isn't to say that if you use rich and flowery language to God out of, a, out of a pure heart and you are expressing your praise to the greatness, of, there's nothing at all wrong with that. Nothing at all. But if you're forcing it because you're trying to fit in some model, if you want to spend hours in prayer to God because it is a gift that you have and it is something you do out of, out of communion with God and out of a rich desire to be closer to God, then that is fantastic. And please don't misunderstand. Nobody is criticizing that whatsoever. We applaud that. But if you're doing it out of guilt and thinking, I just have to keep praying because I've got to fit in this amount of time and God's going to answer my prayer if I just pray longer. We're just making things more difficult than they need to be. And what should be something that brings us closer to God is something that we just stop doing altogether because it feels foreign and it feels distant and it feels really difficult. We make things more difficult than they need to be in a lot of aspects of spirituality. And oftentimes that's derived from good motives. But it doesn't change the fact that we can still make things that God never designed to be this difficult more difficult. And I would contend that at the top of that list is prayer. It's prayer. So this is an appeal that if you're really struggling with prayer, and maybe this is a year-long struggle, maybe it's something you've never, never really been good at in all your life, but this is an appeal. If this is an area in which you struggle, that it's not easy or natural for you to pray, then the appeal is this. Let's just forget what you think you know. Let's just forget what you think you know. And let's start here with what not to do. And the first thing is, let's not pray with the wrong motives. Let's not pray with the wrong motives. So let's make sure that we strip everything else away. And at the core, we make sure that we pray with the right motives. Not to be seen, but in in fact, that we just start in in a very secretive place, in a place where nobody can see us. Maybe that's in, the, in, in your bedroom when you wake up in the morning and nobody else is awake. Maybe it's in your car on the way to work or on the way to an appointment, what, whatever the case may be. It's going to look different for everybody, and that's okay. But if this is something that you've struggled with throughout your life, this is what you need to do. Find a place where you can get alone. Find a place where you can get alone and start there. And instead of, instead of worrying about the positioning of your hands, whether or not your eyes are open or closed, what, you know, the, the language and the vocabulary you use, you start in a place that's private and be yourself. And go from there. God isn't surprised by what we ask for. God isn't surprised by what we need. None of our prayers catch God by surprise. He's like, whoa, I didn't see that one coming. Thanks for putting that on my radar. I'm really excited about that. God already knows. He already knows. And when we start to understand that, 
And when we start to understand that what God really desires from us is for us to be ourselves and for this to be a personal experience that we have with our Creator, it frees us up. And it allows us to get through all of the programming And to connect with the personal God. So maybe one of the things holding you back has been programming. Maybe it's that you try to fit everything into this this narrow box that no longer feels natural to you. Or maybe one of the things holding you back is you've put pressure upon yourself. Because the stakes are high. The stakes in your situation are really, really high. And the thing that you're praying about is a really big deal. I just want to encourage you. While the stakes are high, God already knows. God already knows. And he isn't surprised by what you pray for. Which brings us to a question that all of us have asked at one point or another. And and maybe some are still asking. Is why pray? Why pray? If God already knows what we need, then why not just intervene? Why go through this exercise? Why bother? What's the point of praying if God isn't surprised by what we ask for and He's a loving God and a good Father who already knows what we need? What's the point? Why bother? And the answer is it moves our Father to act. Prayer, you can't argue. Throughout Scripture, we see that prayer moves God to act. In the same way, I know the needs of of my children. I know what they need. And I provide for their needs more so than they will ever fully realize until one day, God willing, they have children of their own. It's just a dynamic none of us understand until we become parents. But even though I know what they need, when they ask for something, with the heart of a father, it still moves me to action. Do I give them everything they ask for? No. Because I value my sanity and I value the fact that they're alive. And if I gave them everything they asked for, my sanity would definitely be gone. And I question whether or not they would still be living. You cannot eat a full uh, 250 count bag of candy and think that's going to go well and do this day after day. But they would try. If I left them to their own devices, they would try. So there are times that I seldom know, not because I hate them, just the opposite, because I love them and I have the value of perspective that they don't have. So why pray? Number one, because it does move the heart of God, our Father, to act even though he knows what we already need, but also to align our heart. So that our hearts align with the will of God. If you've ever driven a car and ran over a major pothole, you know what it's like to drive a car that's out of alignment. And you can do a good job of keeping the car on the road. You have to compensate a little bit for steering. You have to be a little more active than what you would otherwise be. But you can still keep the car on the road, and it can drive fairly well. You just have to keep making adjustments. You just have to keep making those adjustments. You keep hitting potholes. It's going to become more and more challenging. And the adjustments that you have to make on the wheel 
become more drastic. So the point, if you're not constantly pushing the steering wheel, the car is veering either left of center or off the road. In life, we hit potholes. Sometimes we see them coming, and we're just stupid and think, that's not going to hurt that bad. I know I shouldn't, but sometimes we don't see them coming. But our lives can very subtly start to move out of alignment. And without even realizing it at first, we can start to make subtle course corrections. That we think, that's no big deal. I got this. I'm all right. But the more potholes we hit, the more trouble that comes our way. And what prayer is, is it's something that God uses to change our alignment. To change our hearts, to change our wills, to look like His, to straighten our course, and to help us in our quest to become more like Jesus. So forget putting on a show and forget trying to say the right words. And forget the restrictions that maybe you've put upon yourself in your own mind. And connect with your Father who already knows what you need and who loves you and wants to give you good things. Last week we challenged you for the next five weeks to pray about three things every single day. One is something personal to you in your life. Something personal that's going on in your life. Then we challenge you to pray for for something regarding a family or a community. Something regarding your family or your community. And then the third thing we we told you to pray for is something that's work-related or circumstantial. I just want to challenge you. If you weren't here last week, then you start that practice starting today. What are your three things? If you started last week and you fell off a couple days, kick it back up today. And if you've been going strong for the last week, we've enjoyed hearing some of your stories. And we want to hear more. And you can share your story, and we want to we share stories together, and we want to celebrate how we specifically see God work in our lives here as part of a community. And you can do that in a couple, in a couple ways. Or if you want us to join in praying with you, which we do every week, you can either fill out the card on the seat in front of you. On the back, there's something that says, hey, I want you to pray. And you write that down. And we commit as a staff, we pray for you every Monday. And we understand there's some requests you don't want everybody to know. So while we don't listen to anonymous comments, we will pray for anonymous prayer requests. You can email us at prayer at lakeside-church.com. We want to be involved and engaged in lifting you up in prayer because we're part of a community. We want to celebrate the stories that we hear of God working together, and we want to pray for each other. And we want to make it simple, and we want to make it authentic, and we want to have the right motives. God, help us be people who just pray the right way. Let our motives be pure. Let them be right. I pray, God, if anybody here is struggling with this concept of prayer, that they'd forget trying to speak in a special vocabulary. That it wouldn't be about putting on a show They wouldn't drone on and on thinking that the longer they spend in prayer, the more you're likely to listen. But God, they'd see you as who you are, a father who loves them. 
who created them and who wants them to be who they are. So God, I pray that as we individually make a commitment to be persistent in asking you to intervene in our lives and in our stories in these ways, God, that you would go to work. And that we would see success stories and we would see lives changed and we would celebrate together the blessings of the Father. And God, I pray for people who are struggling. Struggling with this concept and this idea. Just let them be themselves. And let them relearn what it means to talk to you. God, we ask you to do incredible things in this city, in this region, for your glory. We ask that we could be a part. And God, I can't help but think the answer to some of that is going to start with us individually and what we're asking you for. So we ask that you would hear and answer our prayers. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.